<laughs> Hello. Good morning, everyone. Just going to let people kind of trickle in here. Happy Friday. Thanks for being with us. <laughs> okay. Okay. Do you want to get started? Yes, please. Hi, hello, everybody. Um, <clears throat> it's nice to be with each other again. Um, today's a good one. We have our special co-host, Dr. Mary Gardner, who is a friend of mine, friend of ours, and an awesome person, a ridiculous person <laughs> in many ways. <laughs> she is... Um, and she really knows what the hell she's talking about for a change. Um, she is the co-founder of Lap of Love. I mean, it is a huge, you have 300 some vets, uh, national, totally in every state. We are in about 32 states, DJ. So we have 300 doctors helping, uh, families in about 130 locations with end of life care. So hospice and euthanasia only. Yeah, right on. So beautiful. I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of meeting some of your crew and what a yeah. cool crew. Um, and she's also an author um, um, of a big book that is just, <laughs> it's just got about every answer to every question you would think of called It's Never Long Enough, um, Practical Guide for Caring for Your Geriatric Dog. And it's great and huge and beautiful and comprehensive. And there's another one coming about out soon about kitty cats yes that one's uh nine lives are not enough and i have to give you a shout out because i gave you a shout out and you are in the book a little bit as well as miss Maisie too oh yay <laughs> she's sleeping through the excitement but um <laughs> That's, well she's an older girl that's she's what an older girl and she was just at the vet all day yesterday um, oh. actually but she's feeling better today Good. um okay all right. Well, so we're going to jump in, guys. So this is it's a topic we've addressed before, but it's huge. There's so much to say. And for many of us, it doesn't get much more heart stringer, stringier than this. Um, it's a big subject for a lot of us. So as usual, we're going to kind of go over, you know, kind of level set with a handful of slides. Um, and then we'll break it open for a conversation and questions and stuff. And just a reminder, guys, this is safe place. You sort of think and feel just about anything. Um, please be kind, but that's about all we ask. Um, be honest. That's the second thing we ask. <laughs> um, and feel free to speak it. This is meant to be casual and light and safe. You can say nothing. You can say everything. Um, so, yeah. And if you're new, welcome. Um, we love doing these things and hopefully we'll see you again. So anyway, let me move over to you, Sonia. Um, hold on. Why is it going there? Okay. There we go. Uh, thank you, BK. Thanks everyone for being here with us. So just wanted to go over how you can interact with uh, Mary and BJ after they've gone through the slides. So you can raise your hand and ask your question out loud and chat with them. Or if you would prefer to not do that, you can type your question into the Q&A and I will read it out loud for Mary and BJ to address. So again, you can raise your hand chat with these guys or if you prefer just type it in and I will uh, read it out for you and same note um, on BJ of being a safe space if you'd like to remain anonymous please just let me know that's no problem and thanks again for being here with us especially for a holiday weekend we're glad to be here too all righty so Mary <laughs> over to you baby <laughs> why thank you um I, you know, I think everybody on this call is probably familiar with the fact that they love their animals, right? And what what sometimes bothers me, and I may be jumping ahead a little bit, is is the notion of you know disenfranchised uh, grief, where people say, "Well, it's just a dog, it's just a cat. Why are you getting so upset over their 
impending loss. And, and to be honest, it's a bird, a guinea pig, a rabbit. There's so many beautiful species out there that a lot of families have, um, you know, brought into their home. So, uh, I mean, I probably would have a guinea pig if I, if I could <laughs> like them too. So um, it's, you know, it's not just an animal. There's such a significance on the furry, the furry and winged creatures that we bring into our lives. It's, you know, they're a source of significance. They're a source of security, a source of emotional um, value. They, you know, they give us comfort. They give us, uh, you know, security feeling. They uh, can, they could be there through such amazing and difficult parts of our lives. Um, and, and the loss or the impending loss of an animal can be, can be insurmountable. It could be, you know, devastating to some people. And I think it's, you know, we get so excited when we adopt a new pet and, um, but, but the time comes a little bit faster for our dogs and cats and, and, and little wee ones than we want. That's why I named the book. It's never long enough because we will lose a significant amount of pets in our, in our lives. And I don't know if everybody's always prepared for that. And even, even me, I think I'm prepared, but when I've lost mine, it's still heartbreaking and, and heart wrenching. And uh, even as a veterinarian and one that kind of, you know, does this for a living, it's tough. And so I think it's really important to let everybody know that our animals are really important, are significant, and to not just shrug it off to say it's just a dog or a cat. Oh, amen. I, that, uh, I have been in very, some very awkward moments with people um, when they've said certain things to me about my animals. I mean, I, there are teachers too. I don't know. The list is long of what they do for us. I remember when I yeah. had my service dog, Vermont, when I got out of the hospital, I cannot imagine being here today without his help segueing back into life. I go on and on and on. Um, <laughs> so I won't, but anyway, amen. Amen to everything you just said. Yeah. There. There huge, and you know, huge relation. as a, as a teacher, like you're just thinking about, you know, they teach us so much. They, they, mine have taught me so much about being an end of life care veterinarian. Like, I think I'm, I'm a better vet because I've gone through the loss. I've gone through the anticipation of the loss. Uh, so I think, you know, I've, I've lost pets where I don't euthanize them and they've died on their own without me present. I've, you know, it's like, and that allows me to help other families that go through it. So they've, they've made me be a better, better human and a better vet. And I would probably surround myself with a lot more animals than people. Me too. Love you too, people. But I, I love us as animals. I mean, I think part of the yeah. significance here is reminding us that we're animals too. And there's, there's not such a huge divide between us creatures on this planet. So, okay. Well, maybe we do have other slides. So maybe we should. Yeah. Oh, sweetheart. Okay. We could talk for a long time, BJ. I know. Oh, I know, Mary. Yes. We'll be careful. <laughs> So, yeah, it's quality of life. This phrase comes up in the human world all the time, but it ain't just for humans, is it? No, no. And I think because of what we have in veterinary medicine, so we have the act of euthanasia, it, it throws a different twist on this concept. And quality of life is probably the number one question I'll, I'll get asked, meaning somebody will say, how, how will I know it's time? And, and someone may just say, well, you'll know when you'll know. And, and I got to tell you, you don't always know. There's, there's a place that I lovingly call Denial Island. And um, I have been the mayor of Denial Island <laughs> myself. And we don't ever want to say goodbye. And so it is not always easy for us to know. And I think sometimes if it is obvious that it's, quote, time to say goodbye, dare I say we, we, we've let them get to a point of, of active suffering mm. that it's so obvious that we could see it. We could see it in their faces, right? We could see like, and do we ever want our pets to get that far? And I'm glad you started this out, by the way, with saying no judgment because there isn't a judgment. You know, I, I, I hope to not be judgmental because I think after helping thousands and thousands of families, I've seen it all. And, and I know the range of emotions, <clears throat> but you know, I, I know that all of us don't want our pets to suffer, but because we could be on Denial Island or with Denial Goggles on, maybe just a little bit of that, <laughs> it's hard for us to assess their quality, but also our own quality of life when we're managing yeah. a, a pet that is, that is bad. So 
Yeah. Um, I think it might be helpful if it's okay. I could kind of go through a little bit of some of the things I talk to families about with, yeah. with this topic. Please. Um, and I've done videos like they're on YouTube of like an hour long, but I, so I won't do that to you. <laughs> <laughs> but just some, <clears throat> some things that I think about when I, when I enter a home and we do everything in the home, which I think is great because then we could really evaluate uh, their natural environment, other pets in the home, the family, you know, dynamic and things like that. So I think it gives us such a, a, a clearer picture than taking your pet to the, to the clinic, but that's not always possible. So um, anyway, so when I go into a home, I'm first going to, I have to understand what the pet's ailments are. And it, that's very different than the disease, BJ. So hmm. um, a sad statistic is that 50% of dogs and cats are not seen by their veterinarian a year before they are euthanized. Mm. So they're not actually, I mean, that's half of the pet population that's euthanized have not been to their doctor their last 10% of their lifespan. That's like us not going to see our doctor for, you know, our 70s and 80s and 90s. Like that's unthinkable to us, right? So I don't always have a disease. We don't know why they're urinating all over the house. I don't know if they've got diabetes or Cushing's or they've just have incontinence, like mm -hmm. someone, you know, that we know that's a <laughs> little girl that you've got there. So like, we don't, I don't know what's necessary. Yeah, she's, <laughs> we got a little issue there. Uh, so, and, uh, or if they've got mobility issues where I don't know if it's bone cancer, arthritis, if it's a neuropathy, so just something long neurologically, but they've got mobility issues. So I'm always going to look at their ailments. So what is the family managing? Are they managing incontinence? Are they managing mobility issues? Are they managing decreased appetite, decreased vision, hearing? The list is long. And that's the other problem too, is that, you know, as our pets get older, I always lovingly call them jalopies. They got a lot of stuff, going, right? So they're, they're stinkier. They're, they're, they whine and pace. They vocalize the little cat, you know, at two o'clock in the morning, you know, wow. Mm -hmm. And just because they, dogs and cats can get Alzheimer's, like a type of Alzheimer's and uh, it's called cognitive dysfunction, but it's just, we always say it's like doggy Alzheimer's. People mm -hmm. don't realize that. And mm -hmm. so that's a lot to manage. So it would be great if we did have a diagnosis because we could help manage these guys so much better. Mm -hmm. I, so if I want to have one soapbox that I can climb on, it's to please bring your pet, an older pet to your veterinarian. Because the sooner we can figure out what's wrong, the better we can address it, right? It's like human. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the sooner we can get them even into a hospice program, the better we could manage pain and anxiety. We get them too late. Mm -hmm. So, and you know me and you could probably get on that topic. So anyway, so I'm going to talk about their ailment and how can I manage it? So, so, you know, is it something, do we have a 20 pound dog with a mobility issue or a kitty cat that we have to just address, you know, their, their litter box and where they're getting on the bed and stuff like that? Or do I have a 110 pound animal that we are moving around? Uh, so, so I'm going to look at their ailments and how a family can manage it. And that's, that's a big problem also is, is how can a family manage these problems? Yeah. And that's, that's where I think a lot of people forget. And, and I always say there's four budgets. There's, there's the, the monetary budget. So can we afford the treatment options? And a lot of families don't have pet insurance. I wish they did. Only 2% of the population has, has insurance for their pets. And it's, it's such a lifesaver and can yeah. help us so much. So there's, there's my other soapbox. But anyway, uh, but it can cost some bit of money at the end if we do have to do some medications and stuff like that, but not always, right? If I could buy a harness, Spend hundred dollars once, and that's like huge improvement to their quality of life for the for the family and for the pet. But it's not always in everybody's budget to 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 have the care. And there's no judgment there. If you can't afford the two hundred dollar heart medication for your dog, then we may need to say goodbye sooner than later because we don't want them to go into heart failure. Mm -hmm. And you know, BJ, what heart failure is like in humans. It's yeah. it's horrible. So yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, there's the, the, there's the financial budget. There's a time budget. They take a lot of time. Mm -hmm. They, you know, you, you get a dog and you leave for work for eight hours and you're not home for 10 hours and they can handle it. But when they're a 12 or 14 year old dog, or even a nine year old dog, 
They have to be let out. They might need their meds every six hours. It's a lot. When you come home, you have to clean up the pee, right? You have to clean up the vomit. You have to like, there's a, you're probably like, yeah, I remember, right? Like I'm doing it most mornings with Maisie's incontinence these days. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's, I did a recent study and uh, people with a geriatric pet spend three hours a day just caring for their pet, making their foods, getting their meds together, you know, cleaning them up. That, that was a big one for me. I had my girl, Sam, she's an angel now, but she, um, she had spinal lymphoma, a very crazy, like rare mm-hmm. disease. So, but the main thing was her mobility issues and she was this big, fluffy 90 pound dog. And so mm-hmm. it was poop and pee every morning I had to clean up and, and clean her fur. So um, that I have a lot of practical tips in my book to help families with managing that. So, um, so that's help of a time people, people, it's a lot of time. Yeah. The other budget, the third budget is the physical budget. So can they physically handle this? And not everybody can lift a 60 pound dog. Not everybody can lift a 20 pound dog, right? If you yourself are dealing with rheumatoid arthritis and you've got a, you know, a, a small dog with, with arthritis, you can't always help them. I, mm-hmm. my mother uh, was, had a dog that Angel is her name and uh, she had mobility issues and she was incontinent too. But, but the problem is my mom had uh, really bad hips. So she couldn't clean up the, the, oh. the, the poop and the floor. So it wasn't even lifting the dog. She couldn't even clean the, the poop because she couldn't get on the floor, right? So, um, and then the last budget, which I think is uh, something that people really forget about, and I think it's just as important as the other three, is the emotional budget. Hmm. Is, do we hold on sometimes longer than we want to? Hmm. And people judge that. I've, I've had a lot of people say, I don't want anybody over my house because they're going to tell me I need to say goodbye and they're going to judge me for it. And this BJ, this pet could be the last living link that they have to a family member they've lost or the pet that helped them through their divorce Mm. or the pet that helped them through chemo, like whatever it is. And they can't say goodbye, right? Like I get it. On the other end, we'll have some people that they want to say goodbye sooner than later. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because they, they may say, I don't want him to be any worse than he is today. Yeah. And then the people will get judged for that too. Like, well, he's still doing well. Why would you, why would you take away good days? Mm-hmm. And uh, it's hard. So at, at any time, BJ, if any of those budgets is up, like, the, you know, blank, yeah. empty, I, I, will, I will help a family say goodbye with no problem, no judgment. Because mm-hmm. if, they, if they can't physically, time-wise, emotionally, monetarily give the best quality of life for their pet or what, what, is, what can we do, then then, then I, I'll help them say goodbye. Yeah, it's so, ooh, it's so charged, isn't it? In all directions. Yeah. It's not, and one of the points you're making, I think, Mary, is when this phrase, this phrase quality of life, it is, a, it's applying to the animal as well as to the family. Yes. And it's as though, and of course we are a unit. Um, and so anyone in the unit who's on empty, that's important data. Yeah. Um, it really is. And I've been to homes where there's massive arguments between partners, between children, um, you know, like one partner may be totally fine picking up the poop every morning or, or hearing the cat cry at two o'clock. And the other is like, I need sleep. You, this is, this is too much. Right. And, um, <clears throat> and that's always a struggle that, that takes, <laughs> that took me a couple of years to learn how to navigate that. And I'm sure you, you, you know it well too. And you have to respect both sides of that. There's, yeah. there's, you know, an understanding on both sides. No, you know, nobody's out just to say like, just to get out of something tough. It's, it's just, it's just tough. Yeah. There, does, there are, yes, that's right. There are no go zones. There are impossibilities, no matter what we want them to be. But, ooh, baby, it's charged. Ooh. It um, is. It's so subjective. Like, yeah, yeah. Have, it you is. Ever, have, it been, have there been moments where you've had to actually say, I have a friend who took their dog to their dog to be euthanized at one point, and the vet said, no, you can, it's too soon. And it was a really, I couldn't, they could, as a family, they weren't on, we couldn't even talk about it. We were friends because right. it was so charged. They were so ashamed, so embarrassed. I but, know. 
And I can't quite tell, I wasn't there. I don't know how to critique that encounter at all, but wow. Oof. It's, it's hard. And so listen, there's definitely going to be times where it's a younger dog that, you know, I'm just, or a cat, whatever. And that it's it, like, okay, so this is really hard because let's say you've got a cat with diabetes, a seven-year-old cat with diabetes, and that's $70 a month for insulin. And you have to give an injection mm -hmm. and the family can't do that. Can't afford it. That is a treatable condition. So yeah. ethically, what do you do? Do you, as a veterinarian, do I say, no, that's a treatable condition. I'm not going to, to euthanize them. Like at what point this, now we're getting into a like, we're, but at, at what point is too much? So let's say it's $75 for insulin, right? Okay. That's not bad. I think we should be able to do that. Well, what about $400? Yeah. My Doberman, he had, you know, he had, he had heart condition. He had mobility issues. His drugs, even as a veterinarian was $400 a month. And so, so would that be okay to euthanize more than the diabetic cat right. because it's right. more expensive? Like, right. so it's tough because we become vets because we want to help animals. Yeah. And sadly, veterinarians are, are, are one of the highest suicide rates out there. Everybody thinks it's the dentist. I learned that from you. Yeah. Yeah. And it's because of situations like this, it's because you know, people blame us for things and, and it's, and it's tough. We, we want to help, we want to save, but we can't do that all the time. So besides those, like, cause those are tough, but if I've got an older pet that if me, for me, it took a few years now, don't get me wrong. I, I'm not, I wasn't, I just didn't come out of vet school perfect, but <laughs> and, and I'm not now, but for me, if a pet has been diagnosed with a, with a, with a disease that will take their life in six months, like I will say goodbye today because my veterinary oath is to prevent suffering from ever occurring. And so let's say a, a good example is osteosarcoma, which is bone cancer. And so if a dog's been diagnosed with bone cancer and the family's like, we don't want her to get, you know, we don't want him to hurt. We don't want him to get bad. Will you do it now? So I, I, will, I, will, I will do that, right? Or if they're so old that their quality of life is bad, they're, you know, they're, They've got a bunch of ailments. We don't have a disease, but they're, they're, they've got the doggy Alzheimer's and they're panting and pacing. They're anxious. But when you go into the clinic, they're fine. Like that's why going to the homes is, is really important. This is, you know, it has really messed my mind up a little bit with this concept. And, and I, I don't mean to be on a soapbox with this, but because of this question, I've actually become a vegan because I'm like, we have to euthanize healthy animals for us to eat yet. <laughs> we have a struggle with this, right? And I love a pig. They're like, great, right? I love a cow. So it's really kind of made me very esoteric. <laughs> so that makes sense. I, 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 I'm sorry for your friend that went through that because it, yeah. they feel judged. Yeah, well, they were judged. Yeah. And, and also, if I'm honest, I think they also, they were having a bad week. And I think, I, know, I think if they could say, I don't think they regret not euthanizing him that day you know okay. actually yeah i think it's complicated and the fact is we actually can't really talk about it to know but my sense right. is there's a piece of them that was also kind of relieved too it's so it's it's complicated it's it is so subjective i have i have a, a workbook that uh, is like a journal system and it also has caregiver questions and it's good to do that so that way you can you know what i'm okay i'm good i'm good and then like oh boy i've had a really crappy week and it's been really stressful I had that too, right? Like I was traveling, I was coming back, she's pooping all over the house, like yeah. up at night, I'm stressed. So we all could have really bad weeks. And, you know, but, but for me also with the quality of life, it's really important also the quality of death. Mm -hmm. And I want it to be good. I yeah. want it to be peaceful. I want them to be, I want their parents to be there, or their family, as much as they can be, no judgment if you emotionally can't handle it, by the way. Yeah. But in their home or in their favorite spot. Like, and I think when we could do journaling and watch the progression, we're able to achieve that a little bit better where we can see the quality going down of both family and pet and at least do that. Yeah. Oh man, there's so much here. I guess I should move on though. Um, <laughs> so, okay, so. Sonia's like, go guys. <laughs> I know. All right, hold on before Sonia's head explodes. Um, okay. <laughs> Oh. Uh, well, we've kind of touched on this a little bit, but more to say here. 
Yeah, it's, um, I don't think everybody understands that there is, you know, the stress of caring for a pet can, can give them caregiver burden, just like in human caregiving. And there's been, and you, so you know this. And so like, gosh, I love talking to you because you get it in such a great way. Mm -hmm. um, there's been studies that have been done in human caregiving and it's, it's, you know, stress, anxiety, depression, suicide thoughts, like all these things of being a primary caregiver or secondary, whatever, right? And there's been studies to see, does that happen also with pet caregiving? And it, it is also there too. So um, don't feel bad if you're stressed, if you're angry, it, like all of those things are, are normal. Like you can get mad at your pet, like it, you know, it, and I get it, I understand. And so um, just, there's so many tools out there. I, I, I gave Sonia a link to a wonderful uh, care, pet caregiver burden uh, website that just got that just has tools to help uh, that will that will post that and you know that's where all like self care comes in that's where getting getting outside help getting someone to come and and watch your pet for a day so you can get a break like respite care we have that in humans it's, it's a lot favorite. right it's so, it's so underutilized though but yeah it's, I know uh, yeah it's yeah I know if I had like tons of money I would. I would create a specialized boarding facility just for terminally yeah. ill or geriatric pets or special needs pets because, yeah. you know, you can't board them and, and we need to. And sometimes, yeah. and people, so people don't go on vacation. People don't take a holiday. People don't do work trips. And yeah. that's a lot of stress because we, we don't have, we don't have those facilities really well. Mm -hmm. And there's not a lot of, you know, veterinary nurses and technicians that come to the home, like in human hospice, that's a wonderful, mm -hmm. wonderful, that are, that is still underutilized uh, um, field. And so we don't have it as well with, with pets. Yeah. Well, I wish you might as you're talking, I, you know, I, part of my brain's going to, gosh, I, <clears throat> I hope, I wish so many people were listening to this conversation, you know, in advance of getting an animal in their life. So that, you know, is, I think there's such a, this is something of a tangent, but you know, the doggy in the window, oh my God, it's so friggin' cute. And it could really make your life for a month or two. And then, you know, you got to really think through, this is a relationship, a very real relationship. And so if you have some sense of the difficulties as well as the joys, yeah. this, perhaps maybe it would be people have entered this relationship a little bit more thoughtfully. That yeah. sounds judgy, even as I say that, but I'm sitting here thinking it, so I'll say it out loud. <laughs> no judgment on your judgy. About my judgyness. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, but but you're right. Or you know what what kind of irks me? I'll go judgy for a quick second. Is when is when we spend money, a lot of money, on a certain breed of an animal. Uh huh. Two thousand dollars. I'm fine if you want to buy a, a, a two thousand dollar Yorkie. Like you go for it. Yeah. But if that Yorkie needs a thousand dollar surgery, I want you to have a thousand dollars to be able to do it. Right. So, because there are about millions of pets in shelters that are like 30 bucks that are awesome. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. so that I think people don't understand financially that the, because we have health insurance for us, we, we don't know how much blood work costs. Have you ever seen your bill for blood work? It's a lot. Mm -hmm. And so veterinarians, we have to charge that too. And so I think people don't, don't realize that, but it's not just about the money. It is time. It's, it's all these things you've got to, you know, they're, they're, they're not just for that month. They're there for a decade at least. Yeah. It's a real, it's a long-term relationship. Yes. Um, okay. Um, yeah. so, there you are. There I am. So this is, uh, this is a, a, a dog, a, a friend of mine, Gloria, and her little, her little one, Pepe. And uh, this is what we do. We go to homes. We could be outside. We could be in a car. And uh, she actually came to my house. And uh, she came and, and said, it's fine to take pictures. And, and I think making this decision. So we started out with, I said, like, we have something different in, in veterinary medicine. We have euthanasia, which it, it, it technically means a good death. But it is, it is uh, ending a pet's life. And I think it's, an, it's good for me to spend a minute or two on the process because a lot of people freak out about this, BJ. And yeah. because they don't know, they may not want euthanasia. And, and mother nature, they, they want to wait for mother nature to, to, to take their pet. And 
if you've mm. got a dog with arthritis and they're not walking around and they're and they're like mother nature's not coming she's yeah. like arthritis doesn't do it right yeah heart failure yes and that is a very bad way to go but arthritis you're you know she's i always say mother nature's neither fast nor friendly she mm. could be real you know b <laughs> so she's you can say the and, you can say the b word here I don't know if I say the B word or not, but she can be. And um, so we are able to end a pet's life in a very peaceful way. So um, so whether it's at a veterinary clinic or at your home or in the car, I've been on boats, I've been all over, I've been on beaches. So uh, it's 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 wonderful to be able to provide an environment that's that is relaxing for everybody. So we can give a really good goodbye and and honor that. So uh, Typically here in the United States, we um, typically veterinarians will sedate a pet first. So give them a little injection under the skin to make them uh, you know, a little calm and comfortable. Sometimes a veterinarian, the team will take them to the treatment room in the back to, to put in a catheter or something like that. But uh, we usually always provide sedation. Uh, most, most, we don't have to, but most do. And that's what Pepe right now is sedated on her lap. And then the second, so they're, 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 they're basically sleeping or, or very comfy, little twilight, if you will. Uh, and then, uh, and listen, I've had about 30 surgeries in my life and there's, I like a little twilight. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both, girl. <laughs> yeah. It's always a little legal twilight is, is not a bad thing. So it makes them feel good. And I, what's really nice about sedation also is a lot of times it allows an owner to see their pet out of pain and anxiety for the first time in a long time. Mm. And you may have, you may notice that I recently went through hospice with a family member and she was very anxious before, uh, before they decided to put her to hospice. And, uh, and, you know, I'm still a little upset over this because hospice is not just this. So that's like my, my problem, but you know, they gave her morphine and she relaxed and she wasn't, you know, scratching at her face. And it, and it was just so peaceful for everybody in the family to see her relaxed yeah. and not anxious. Right. So that's the beauty of sedation. Um, and that's what we could do. And so many families like, oh, gosh, it's so nice to hear him snore, you know, and just have that. And, you know, no time limit on enjoying that. You know, if you want to spend 20 minutes snuggling, go right ahead. Uh, and then the second medication that we give, and that's what I'm doing here. It's a little pink syringe that you'll see. Uh, the, the fluid is pink. It, it's either pink or blue usually. And that is an overdose of anesthesia. So that actually travels to the brain. It puts the brain to sleep. The brain is what tells our organs and muscles and everything to function. And so when the brain is gone, everything then follows. So there'll be end of respiration. The heartbeat will stop and things like that. So it is... Uh, it is not stopping the heart like a heart attack. So many people think that, which is very painful. So it's very peaceful and, uh, and typically, typically very fast. Sometimes it does take a little longer with blood pressure and things like that. So I just like people to understand the process because they're so scared of it. And we don't have it in human medicine because that's not, that's not the right to die. Very different. Yes. Real quick note on that. Uh, right. Euthanasia is, is technically you, the doctor, are administering the lethal medicine. Yes. And that is not legal any in the, anywhere in the country for humans. The doctor cannot accept in prison systems in certain states. Um, that's the only exception. But otherwise, euthanasia, is that, that word means different things to different people. But technically, the difference in humans is in right to die states, I can prescribe you lethal medicine. Yes. You take on your own at your time. So yep. it's importantly a little, little different. So different. Uh, and but with our euthanasia, there is a level of guilt that a lot of families will have because they think they're murdering their best friend. You know, they that's it's it's and I get it. Like it's even for me, it was for I always euthanize my own animals. And there's I don't know if there's a level of guilt now because I think I just have a, I have a different mentality towards it, but I understand that. And yeah. some people don't want to do it because they just feel so guilty about it. And that's where I say, let me be the one to decide this. Yeah. It's not yeah. you. Like, yeah. And mercy. Yeah. Yeah. It is, it is very mercy. You know, it's, it is a lot of mercy around it because if we don't, that, that, that be mother nature. Not yeah. Good. <laughs> good. Yeah. And I think for so many, this comes up one way or another in humans too, is to remind each other, whether it's opting out of treatment or whatever it is, reminding each other that death's coming either way. It's yeah. 
It's not like you're choosing death versus live forever. It's death's coming yes. either way. So it's a matter of how we're going to do this. It's a really importantly different frame than I think a lot of us, unless we really say that out loud or think it through, the supposition is, well, I'm I'm choosing this love, this my beloved thing to die today. And the alternative is life. I'm choosing right. death. And that's right. wrong frame. Or and and a lot of times we'll say we're not actually ending life. We're ending the dying process. Yeah. Right. Like we're suffering. Yeah. We're ending suffering. We're they are dying. Like if you've got a dog at end stage kidney failure, they will be dying. Yeah. And the other thing too is is no judgment if you want to be present or not. I I always like to be present for my own pet's passing. Mm -hmm. um, but euthanasia definitely allows for that. Mm -hmm. You can be there. I want to hold their paw and say, thank you. Right. Like I want to be present and make sure that they've got ice cream or a cookie or whatever it is. And if we allow them to pass on their own, just like in humans, they could die at any time. Yeah, that's right. So, okay. I, um, we should keep moving my friend. Okay. I know. No, sorry. No, no, it's so good. We just, but we've got the questions. We want to get to the questions. So anyway. I know. I'm going to try to move us along a little bit. Okay. So, um, yeah, yeah, grief. It, and I think I touched a little bit on this with the, with the disenfranchised grief. The, the loss is a, is a huge loss. And there's a lot of great pet loss support groups. At Lapa Love, we have a free uh, pet loss support group. So we have uh, group sessions. We also have one-on-one -on -one sessions. And you could go through all of the um, different emotions, anger, you know, sa sadness, disbelief. So, uh, you know, loneliness, especially if, you know, I, I miss the, I miss the smell of my guy, right? Even though it was horrible, mm -hmm. I miss it. I miss the, the sound of his nails on the ground. Um, and there's no time limit to grief, uh, just like in humans. And there are some people that are years out and still grieving. I, I actually, BJ, I grieve for two of my cats that I lost to coyotes. And because I was not able to say goodbye and I was not able to, to, you know, it's not so much the, the tragic loss, but I couldn't say goodbye. Like I, I struggle with that. Like, yeah. and that's four years ago. So I get it. it's, it's a, yeah. it's a big thing. And now another question that Sonia wanted me to touch on is, is animal grief and do animals grieve for their sibling or housemate? And the answer is that they can in some ways. So there's been many studies, you know, it, one was back in 98, another, a couple of more recent ones where they, they looked at dogs and cats that have lost another dog or cat or, or interspecies kind of a thing. And uh, it's, it, you know, there's things like 30 to 40% of cats will, will decrease eating afterwards. Some will totally go inappetent, so they don't want to eat at all. Uh, the, the biggest thing is vocalizing. So 70% may vocalize. They mm -hmm. may change their patterns of where they sleep. Um, and so they, they can change. Now, is that grief? I don't know, but you know, I listen, I've learned this from you, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a change, right? So something's going on in their little brains. And, um, sometimes also they're fine. I've been, I have been present where like the other dog is licking my face and like, get on with this because mm -hmm. I want to love up on you, Mary. Right. And so and the owners are mad, like at the other dog or cat. Mm -hmm. um, but I have been, uh, you know, I've been present for a number of wonderful things where like this cat came out and never, never comes out for strangers and comes out, sits on my lap and watch and is there for the whole thing and, yep. or will lay next to their cat after, you know, their friends, dogs or cats afterwards. And it's just, it's, that's why I also love being at home is because we can, we can allow that if they want to sniff and things like that. So yeah. I give a lot of tips in my book for, for helping those, um, whether it's, you know, keeping the bedding so that way they can smell. Smell is so big in dogs and cats. Mm -hmm. uh, keeping, even, by the way, this is a fun fact that, uh, so they've done it. They did a study with some dogs in, in MRIs where they would, they would unsedated, they trained them to sit still, that they would, that they would present different smells to the, to the dog. And they would, they would look at the lighting of the, you know, pleasure centers of the brain. And the scent of their owner was like the one that triggered it out the most. So it was like, mm -hmm. so Maisie's brain would go crazy when she smells you. And all, <laughs> I mean, maybe it's your musk, but uh, and also the second is their, their housemates. 
So mm -hmm. they really love the smell of the house. So if you ever have to board your pet, leave your dirty shirt with them. So that way they've got the smell of you or a housemate. So that's why keeping their collars, you know, you can put the collar on the other pet, things like that, a blanket. So don't like go and wash everything because that may be comforting to them. Beautiful, great tip. Um, okay, I'm wondering if we should cut to questions. Okay. Well, let's see, let's see if we can, well, have we cut, touched on this? We have in a way, or what do you think? We have in a way. I think I think most people don't know that there is such a thing as as veterinary hospice. It's mm -hmm. it is different than human hospice in some ways, and and also similar too. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why you know that's why you and I started to become friends is because we have this this love for it. And for me, it's simply making sure that the that their quality of life is good up until the end. It's not about how they die, but how they live until they die. Right. And the soon it does not mean we're giving up. It does not mean we're just sedating them and that's it. And that's where that's where I'm upset over my my uh you know family member dying this summer because everyone just thought that's what it was. And I'm like, no, I wish we got her in sooner. Yeah. Like we could have done better things. So exploring hospice sooner than later, if they've got three months to live or something like that, like let's make it good. Yeah. And so ask, I mean, I guess the difference would be, it's not an insurance designation, like in human, no. you know, six months or less to live kind of line, or you have to give up something to go on, you know, give up certain kinds of care. Yeah. None of that is true in animals. Yeah, yeah. It's really, it sounds like it's more truly just a purely the philosophy yeah. that we've basically been talking about. So yep. right on. Okay. So uh, when in doubt, just ask your vet, basically, if it's appropriate, yeah. if it's time, if it's possible. Okay. I'm going to cruise this along real quick. Do, do you think we've touched on this one too? I think I, I think I covered this pretty good. Yeah, I think so too. Okay. All right, I'm going to keep cruising. The questions are so fun and so important. I so know, I love them too. I think this Ooh. is the last slide actually. So this question about when or, yeah, I'll, I'll, over to you. Yeah, okay. This is such a subjective thing as well. Uh, so if you are caring for a sick pet, and some people say, get another pet before the other one dies. I just say, let's make sure you can handle all of that. Let's make sure that your current one isn't going to get upset. Sometimes they're like, whoa, I got a new friend and it brings them joy. So, you know, this is a test situation. Maybe, you know, borrow a friend's dog for a weekend first just to see, because they could get very upset over having a change in the house and things like that. So, um, but there's so many, there's so many, uh, factors in getting another pet. And I, I, myself, when, when Sam died, uh, a year and a half ago, I did almost a year of intense care. Like that was a lot. And I needed a break. Yeah. I needed a year. Do I want another pet? Yes. I love them. Right. But I needed time for myself. Yeah. And, uh, and when I'm ready to open my heart again, I will. And I think that's it. You just, Sometimes they fall into your lap as this picture yeah. shows, right? Like, and just, I'd love to let it happen organically and, and it's okay to take a while it, and do not feel bad if you're like the next day getting another pet. Mm -hmm. And to me, that shows how well the first pet did their job. Mm -hmm. They did it well. If you can't imagine not spending a day without one. And uh, so okay. I think it just, it shows how much you loved them. Yeah, for me, it was, I think it was over seven years between Vermont dying and getting Maisie. I was, I needed seven years to yeah. be ready, honestly. I mean, there are other things going on in my life, et cetera, but yeah. I really wasn't emotionally ready. Um, so yep. here again, not a right or wrong answer, except to say, you know, it's probably not an impulse purchase, you know, yeah. um, so no. But uh, okay, guys. All right, Sonia, thank you for your patience. Mary, you're awesome. These are, we could talk forever, but let's get on over the questions. Sonia? Okay. Uh, yeah, thanks, guys. Sorry. I know <laughs> this is really good, but I also want to get to everyone's questions. Yeah. Okay, so the first one that came in um, was if you've rescued a pet, especially an older one, how realistic is insurance given that the medical history might be an unknown? Hmm. Right. That's a great one. So I am also a senior pet, like uh, adopter person. And uh, I, my, my Doberman was almost seven when I adopted him. And so that, which is, which is, a, you know, nearing senior years. Um, I think there are, there are insurance policies out there that will, uh, that will take on older pets, but it will be more expensive 
per month, right? So instead of $50 a month, it might be $125. So I think it's simple budgeting. I, I think that, I think everybody should have $2,000 in savings for every pet that they have you know, or, or not every pet, but have it for, for an emergency or treatment options or things like that. Uh, I mean, it, it's, you don't have to, but it's just, it's just helpful. So I think, you know, if, it depends on the year, how old they are. If you adopt a 12 year old dog, I probably wouldn't, but, but know that if stuff happens, it's going to be a couple hundred bucks a month. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. Got it. I am an idiot. I have never gotten pet insurance and you, uh, I, you- I, I do, and I'm a vet, BJ, because guess what? My dog had to go to the had to go to the cardiologist. Well, we, they don't they don't let me get a cardiologist visit for free. So, yeah. you know, it was it was super helpful. Mm. I'm learning. Okay, Sonia, what else we got? Yeah, next one up is do you, and when we say you, I'm assuming lap of love, educate families about pet home funerals for themselves, family, and friends, and creating rituals around saying goodbye. Of that. So we do have some resources. I also have a lot in my book too. There's, uh, there's also a great company, um, woman, Colleen Ellis, who's wonderful. And she has a company called Two Hearts Pet Loss Center. And she's got a lot of good education on there too. Um, and so we do have some uh, uh, available. And I love, a, I love a funeral or a celebration, you know, with, with euthanasia, that when, I, when I, I speak a lot to veterinarians, so I go to conferences and yap about about end of life care to, to vets. And with humans, when a human dies, usually a week, let's say later, typically we'll have a funeral or a memorial service or whatever. We don't normally have that in medicine, in veterinary medicine. The euthanasia is often the last time you will be with your pet. And so that's why I encourage veterinarians to make it good because this is the funeral. This is it, like uh, bring flowers, like, the, you know, have, ha- do the thing, right? And and if a family wants to say a prayer over their pet, like sit there for the prayer, even if you're, you know, don't believe in it, <laughs> who cares? So um, if you're an atheist, just go along with the prayer. Like who cares? <laughs> I've been, I, I've been through some wonderful services. I, I, uh, you know, I was born and raised Catholic, but I've been to many Jewish ceremonies and like Ruchata and that, like they start, I love it. And so we definitely encourage whatever you want. Also, just know that if you want to keep your pet for a day or two after the euthanasia, that's okay. Don't think that's weird. And uh, I've had many people that are that thank me for saying that because they just wanted one more night with the pet in the house, right? Mm-hmm. Like that's okay. You know, you could just you know wrap their bottom in a little sheet or a towel or something. The stuff is going to happen, mm-hmm. but uh, you know they're not going to explode or do something bad. It's like a it's it's okay. Yeah. And, um, and, and that way you can, you can have your time to, to memorialize them. I remember when, when, when Vermont was euthanized, we was at the vets in Milwaukee. And I remember I was just so out of sorts and I left there in a daze and I ended up going back that night. And it was a, and they were so cool to let me in. And they just, and he was in the morgue, you know, in the freezer. Yeah. And I just went back and sat with him in the freezer. It's just, I just couldn't. And it was very it's, helpful. It was very, actually, it was really. I, I agree. When, when my, before I became a vet, I, I became a vet in my thirties. So it was in my late twenties and one of my dogs died and, and it was at the clinic and I wasn't, it was my first dog to die, my dog. Right. And I was just like, I'm taking him home. I didn't, I just didn't what hurts rather. I didn't want to say goodbye yet. And, and then another story recent, not recently, maybe five, five years ago, actually this month, I lost a kitty cat. She had a, a kidney failure, but it was acute. So I wasn't home for it. So I Skype, I did a FaceTime euthanasia with my cat because I couldn't be present. I was traveling. And so I put her in the little morgue in our little freezer Mm. and I kept her body for about three weeks Mm. because I was not ready to say goodbye. And I just, I looked at her every day and I put a little flower there and I just, I wasn't ready to say goodbye to my little Lilu. And then finally, when I was it, so it was okay. Like, Okay, back to you, Sonia. I know there's a lot going on in here. Um, Tell me to shut up. 
<laughs> no, you're so good. No, here. they're great answers. Great, great, great answers. You might just have to stay a little bit past. We'll stay a little, a little longer. Yeah, <laughs> to answer these. Um, this person said, I just lost my 17 year old girl to kidney failure three weeks ago. I have two more dogs and one has cardiomyopathy mm -hmm. and an adrenal gland tumor, which has led to Cushing's, Cushing's mm -hmm. disease. My anticipatory grief is really ongoing and I want to treasure each moment. How do I do this? Oh, gosh. Oh. So I've had three dogs with Cushing's and my one dog had adrenal tumor. So, so I know I I'm with you. I understand like on so many, I can empathize in so many ways. And my Doberman had a, had a heart uh, cardiomyopathy. So mm -hmm. I understand. Um, it is hard. You're, it's just like in humans, sometimes you could be so present in the problem and in the, and in the disease and in the treatment and things like that, and not enjoy the good times. And I know as cheesy as this sounds, but I love a bucket list. Mm -hmm. And so I've got some really good examples of bucket lists. And just, and they're going to be different now, you know, as they're sick than they were probably before, but I made a bucket list for, for so for my big guy, Duncan, who had uh, my Doberman, who had cardiomyopathy, it was like, one of them was peeing on the neighbor's plants. Mm -hmm. Right. And I, and I just wrote a list barking at the mailman, having all his girlfriend, his human girlfriends come over and say goodbye, uh, mm -hmm. having a in and out party because <laughs> I was in California at the time mm -hmm. and just making that beautiful. I made it all nice with different color pens. And I just, you know, checked off every single one. Mm -hmm. I also, and it just was so nice at the end. Was I sad? Yes, but I had no regrets. I did everything. And it's, it could be as something as simple as getting a photographer. I love professional photography and, and it doesn't have to be, you know, your face and their face, but just their paw or their nose or whatever you're going to miss so much. And so for me, I love bucket lists. And I, if, in that case, it's helpful just for, from working with humans in a version of this, you know, I think the answer here is, I think the answer to so much of this stuff is just trying to be authentic and real and sadness is not your enemy. Tears are not your enemy. Mm -hmm. And if you can kind of be present with all of it, I think you'll find you will most certainly find if you're being present, you will be present for all that sorrow and all that grief. And that same stuff will point to the joy, those little, the joy of that little cold nose or whatever it is. I mean, if you're just, I think the answer is being real with yourself and being present, not kicking any emotion out of out of the picture, um, because invariably in there are some sweet stuff too. I, I, so I don't know if that helps, but it's what I got to say. Um, Helped me. I like that. <laughs> all right. Okay, goody. Well, uh, Sones, what else we got? Yeah, this is a, it's a very popular topic. <laughs> this person, this next person said, have you ever supported a dog owner who experienced complicated grief when their pet died? For example, their grief is so intense that they aren't able to interact with others for months due to their emotional state. Yeah, so uh, like I said, we do have uh, a pet loss support group. However, those are not counselors. And so there comes a time. No, look at the right on cue. Right on cue. Oh my gosh. There comes a time where I think professional counseling is wonderful and can be so helpful. And so we will direct people to that because I'm a veterinarian, right? I'm not a human counselor. I, I, I can counsel on some things, but, but there comes a time where professional help and guidance is so helpful and also group sessions and talking to others. So that is where I will direct them to because I want them to get the best help. But, but by the way, there are many people who cannot talk. They, they go into hiding, you know, they, they go into their house and they go into their grief for months. That's, that is a thing and no judgment. Right. And, and there's also people who go out to dinner that night and th that's okay too. Like, yeah. and I think, I think sometimes hospice and, and things like the bucket list and stuff like that for me, it gives me a lot of time to, to say goodbye, to say, I love you every day. So I feel like that helps me shorten my, the horrible grief. <laughs> Let me tell you, I cry the house down when I lose a pet. Like I, I ugly cry, they're sobbing. There's, I don't want anybody near me. There's like snoggle coming out, but I feel that I can, you know, start mourning and, you know, memorializing them a little bit better when I have that free time to take care of them and say goodbye and say, I love you. But um, true mental health counselors are wonderful. And dare I say, that's why like mental health is great because there's so many uh, 
you know, great resources and help that you guys provide on the human side. Yeah. We need it for pet side. Right on. Yeah. And there ain't no shame in getting help. Oh my Lord, no shame in it at all. And I also hear one of their answers too, one way or another through the conversation today has been like, if you can find a way to living every day, you know, and not waiting to say, I love you, not waiting to appreciate their little quirks or whatever it is. That's the best way to prepare yourself for their yeah. death, you know, sense, yep. you know, so don't, don't delay all the good stuff. That's the way to, that's the kind of kindest thing you can do to prepare yourself for the hard stuff. Um, okay. Sorry. Anyway, Sonia, sorry, I'm getting eye boogers out of it. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> sorry, Sonia, save me, please. Um, so Mary, quick question. Are you okay to stay a little bit over? To oh yeah. Address? Okay. Wonderful. So if anyone needs to drop off, if you've asked your question, I've got them noted. So we'll have it addressed in the recording, um, but just want to get through these. So this person said, um, can you speak to pets hiding illness? Our dog had Cushing's and we euthanized her at home. Our cat started meowing, going to all the doggies favorite places and then stopped eating. We took her to the vet. She had cancer all throughout her body. And prior to the doggies death, we saw no signs of illness at all. And she died three weeks after that. Okay. Yeah. So uh, that, that took a turn where I wasn't ready and then, but I, but I like it. And uh, because cats and dogs and and other animals uh, don't necessarily complain really well. And I think sometimes they do a lot with acute an acute problem. So if they, you know, torn a ligament in their knee and they're limping, right, then we see that. Um, but there are there are subtle signs that can happen that we don't that we don't recognize, that we just think it's their normal behavior. So don't feel bad if you don't recognize stuff. But this is why I wish people brought their pets to their to their doctor more because we see things. There's um, in my cat book I've got a lot on and the dog book too on on signs of pain because it could be it could be something simple as their ears are turned a little different and you might not have noticed that but they're you know maybe a little bit more horizontal than straight up. Their whiskers are held back a little bit. Their, their, their fur on their back sticks up a little bit, kind of like bedhead. <laughs> well, a lot of cats with arthritis, they're not going to lick their, you know, they groom themselves all day long, but they don't. So then they get a little like nasty back there, you know, dandruffy and stuff like that. So there's a lot of times people just say, oh, he's just getting old. Well, yes, but they're also in pain or discomfort, but don't feel bad if you don't notice it because it's not always easy. And it, it, you know, they, people say, oh, well, he's purring. Well, that doesn't mean everything's fine. Sometimes that's a, a release mechanism for them to, to get comfort. So, um, you know, a tail flicking differently, they're just so minor. And when you're in your busy day, when you've got all the other stuff going on in your world, like I get it. Uh, but, you know, a cat not, not going to the bathroom in their litter box, that's something. That's not just them being a butthead. That's something, right? So I do encourage people to bring their pets. I love to keep a little diary of how they're normally acting and what they're doing going forward. But it's, it's not that they're hiding it. They just don't complain. And there could be such mild signs that it's hard for you to see. So I also love taking pictures and videos uh, often. And, and so when Sam was nearing her end of her life, my dog, Sam, with the mobility, with the spinal cancer, I watched a video of her chasing my other dog. And it was only maybe six months prior. And I thought, oh, mm. that I forgot that. And that was just six months ago. Because what she is now, you know, when, when you go through a chronicity and long term, you just, it becomes the new normal, right? Like, Listen, I, I I get aches and pains around the house, and I'm thinking if I was 20, 30 years younger, this wouldn't have been an issue. But <laughs> so I think watching videos and looking at pictures can be really helpful for you to just identify a change that you might not have seen just organically. That's a good point. It happens in humans too. If you're really close in and you're seeing someone all day, every day, you might not notice changes yeah. over time. Yeah. Um, so also asking others, you have know, friends who are whatever who haven't been around for a while who haven't seen the cat or dog or yeah. whatever might notice. Um, that happens a lot, BJ, with uh, holidays that come up because families will come to in back into town and they'll say like, uh, what's going on with Jonesy? Like that, he looks a lot skinnier than before. And they're mm -hmm. like, oh really? I didn't notice that, right? So 
you know, even myself, I don't know where 30 pounds came from in the last 20 years, but like, it... <laughs> oh, golly. Right on. Well, and it's subtle. I was just read at the vet yesterday with Maze, as I've referenced a couple of times, and she's lost weight and I had and a significant amount of weight and I had not noticed. Um, and I, I take a lot of pride in noticing things about yeah. her. Anyway. And um, also body composition could change too. So they, they will lose muscle and maybe gain fat. So sometimes their weight is the same, but their composition is worse. So now they don't have the ability to jump up as well as they could or get up in the bed or all that good stuff. So, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, let's see. Next one. This is a kind of an intersection of both of our worlds here. Um, what about our vulnerability increasing when we have our own life limiting illness and we worry about our pets, that crazy kind of transference. Our pets know when we are sick and the importance of a ritual when we lose a pet and deal with a burial, it's so tough. I mean, not really a question in there, but maybe just speaking to living with your own illness and thinking about your pets and mm. them dealing with your loss. Ooh, that's a good one, BJ. Like, I, I just helped, I was doing, I was helping uh, another speaker because they were doing a, they were doing a talk on caring for senior pets when you're a senior. Mm. Right? Like, and so it's similar, right? Whether you have your own disease, but it's tough because our pets get the same disease as we do. And so many people don't realize that they're like, I didn't know a dog can get cancer, you know, or diabetes and things like that. And so it's tough also for us veterinarians, because we may be wanting to recommend euthanasia and that person has the same disease like that gets us in a in a in a not in an ethical just a, a mind screw because we don't do that for humans right so <clears throat> that's tough that's that's tough and sometimes we can maybe appreciate or empathize with our pets a little bit more when we're going through some struggles to understand hey you know what cognition that's a that's a big deal amen I don't know if I have anything beautiful. DJ, I'm sure you have something. I don't have anything beautiful, but I was just thinking about my own example when I had my surgeries this last year and kind of being laid up. And for one, it was a real bond with, I, you know, I have old cats and old dog and it, and it was sweet. It did bring us closer yeah. in a way. There, there was mm -hmm. part of us just because I was around, but anyway, there, there was, there, but there was this perceived perception that we were kind of, you know, vibing with each other in some similar shared zone. But the other, the other thing I might add to this is, you know, is this simple yet often complicated response of, well, get help, you know, like you might need some help if you know you're going to be in the hospital and arranging for someone to be with your animal is huge. So in the huge. same way, the human side of things, we need help. We're all, we, there's no shame in that. We are interdependent, period, end of story. So sometimes it's hard to find that help. Mm -hmm. But especially with animals, I, you know, in my case, like you want them, uh, if possible to, you know, it's nice to introduce uh, someone who's going to come in and take care of the animals while I'm in the hospital and inter to overlap with them. So the animals see us being comfortable together has mm -hmm. felt important. But anyway, yeah. only, only response I have that, that seems of practical importance would be to get, to get help. Yeah. Friends, informal. I know there are folks who you can hire. Mm -hmm. Oh, one of our beloved folks, Janet, she can be, she does, has a business around uh, pet sitting and stuff. So get help. Mm -hmm. Okay. Not a beautiful answer, but a practical. <laughs> yeah. This person so, said, I just lost my 12 year old golden doodle. Um, I'm devastated by the loss. And we also have a 16 year old doodle who is struggling with dementia and mobility issues. Mm -hmm. I believe it's time to say goodbye, but I'm not sure I can take losing both within weeks of each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is, this is that emotional budget, right? So sometimes we hold on to them longer because we we're going through something. Uh, I think my, my biggest advice would be make sure that the 16 year old has got good pain management and anxiety management on board. So it's, you know, it, I understand delaying the euthanasia and that's okay. As long as we can prevent as much suffering as possible. And dementia is tough. It's really hard. Like that, I just can't stand doggy dementia and kitty dementia because uh, it can be really frustrating. So there's a lot of good medications uh, that, that we can give and some enrichment tools and stuff like that. So the sooner we get them on really good stuff, and it, you probably have them on it, which is fine. 
but just, you know, try not to feel guilty about it. Um, but that's, that's the big thing is making sure that they're still, that they're still getting cared for. And this tough. a lot of people lose, they get dogs together. I mean, yours is 12 and 16, so that's far apart, but a lot of people get two dogs or cats around the same time and they'll lose them around the same time. And I've even done euthanasias of multiple pets at, at one time. Because one will have mobility and one will have kidney failure or something like that. So uh, the other thing too is your one with cognitive, you know, problems now could be more anxious because of the loss of the other one also. Mm. So that can make it even worse for them. So there's a lot of stuff that we could do to help that. Mm. Right on. Jones, and are there more? Yeah, there's a few more here. Um, this person said, I'm sitting here with my, looks like 13 and a half, 14 year old pit bull who was set to be put down on Sunday due to liver and lung cancer. Mm -hmm. This is a very direct question for this animal. Is it normal that her breathing has gotten extremely labored in a week? I'm so shocked by how quickly she has declined. I really thought we had more time. Uh, yeah, first off, I love pit bulls because they have a smile from ear to ear. They're just mm -hmm. an amazing breed. Um, so I believe heaven will be very lucky to have your smiler up there. But uh, yeah, so lung cancer is going to take their, their lung capacity away and it can happen very quickly. I also worry a little bit about some bleeding in the lungs too. So that could happen with, with cancer. So, um, and that can happen quite fast. So, sorry, Sonia, was it this weekend that they're saying goodbye? Yeah, Sunday. Yeah. Okay, good. Like I, I wouldn't, I would, if it was next Sunday, I'd say you might want to make an appointment sooner because I think there's nothing worse than the inability to breathe and, or the, or the, or the, you know, uh, the, the, the thought of not being able to breathe well too. So some, a quick trip that I like to tell people is to get a fan and put it in, in front of their face. And I think this is probably in humans too, VJ. So there's little nose receptors, nerves that, that will trick the brain that, uh, they're not, uh, having as much of a struggle to breathe. And that's, it's a lot of emotional, like we could be difficult to breathe. Like our body does what it needs to do, but it's our brain that messes with us. Right. Mm -hmm. So if we could trick the brain to not be so anxious about it, that's, that's helpful. So I would just get a fan for right now too. Yeah. Fans great in humans too. Opiates, I'm assuming opiates are sort of first line for shortness of breath in humans. Is that true? In yeah, we could. She probably doesn't have that though. That's, that's the problem. It's, this is where human hospice is different than us. Like it's, I mm -hmm. wish we could. Um, and it could also be a mild sedative, which is, which is good uh, also. And we, but then some people don't want to want them sedated because they want them awake to say goodbye. It's, it's a struggle. So um, I, I, like, I'm glad, uh, glad is such a bad word. I'm so sorry, but I'm, 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 I would encourage you to say goodbye sooner than, than later once we have that difficulty breathing. So uh, I think Sunday is good that it's soon, but so just treasure every breath you know, that we have. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, this one, this person said, like you said, vets go into veterinary medicine to help animals. Is there a struggle amongst vets to talk with their patients about hospice and end of life care for their animals? Um, a lot. So, so veterinary hospice is, is a much younger niche than human hospice, right? I forgot BJ when it was aborted, I think in 2008 in humans or something like that. It, it's not even a boarded thing for us. 2006 and Six. For, See, yeah. close. So, close. Uh, so a lot of, when I started, I remember one time I was lecturing at a, at a, at the largest vet conference in the world. And I ran into a professor of mine and I said, Oh, I'm speaking on hospice. Aren't you proud? And he said, I don't believe in hospice. I don't believe in prolonging suffering for my own selfishness. That was his response. So I said, well, you better come to my lecture because that's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. And so it, because it's a, a rel, like less than 20 years in, 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 in veterinary medicine, it, not every vet knows of it, or they still have some misconceptions. So that is me and uh, my, my business partner, Danny, and Dr. Sheila Robertson, who's watching. We go and talk all the time to vets because we want them to understand that it is not about prolonging suffering. Uh, mm -hmm. So some may just not understand that concept. Also, I think sometimes vets are scared to bring it up because they don't want, you know, they've been, they've been your doctor for your pet from, from cradle to grave, right? Like the whole time. And it's hot. It's hard for them too. Like 
we're not about the money, but we, but it's, you know, they don't want to feel like they're giving up too, or meant or bringing something up that may be very uncomfortable to bring up. Uh, I, we are such a death adverse society that I, you know, nobody wants to talk about it. And so I think that it's very helpful to say, Hey, we have these options, but we also have this option and just talk about it sooner than later and not, you know, not struggle with it as much. So, um, we, we are very good. Veterinarians are very good with active suffering. Like that is so obvious that we will say it's time. But when it's these longstanding things like doggy dementia or kidney failure in a cat, like it's, there's no black or white answer. It's, it's mm -hmm. such a shades of gray, 50 shades of gray. And end of black. <laughs> <laughs> Sex and death. Okay. So, um, but real quick question, is there, uh, can any vet, just who has this sort of sensitivity say, you know, hang a shingle and say, Hey, I'm doing hospice or is yes. there something more to it? The <laughs> so technically, yes, we are not allowed to say that we are experts <clears throat> or a specialist. So I am not a specialist in veterinary hospice. I limit my practice to, or I exclusively do things like that. You must be boarded in something. So Dr. Sheila Robertson, who's watching, she is boarded in anesthesiology. So she's an expert and a specialist. But um, uh, so, so we don't have that. We do have some organizations that are available. There's the IAAHPC, which is a big veterinary ho animal hospice organization. And there's some certificate, but training I, like that. I've been doing hospice longer than that certification program was available. So it's just education. Right. Um, but you're right. I think it's sensitivity. It's a, it, is, it is a quality of life discussion. It's, it's support. So it's, it's, it's also into interdisciplinary. So knowing who to ask, I don't have to hire all these people, but I need to know who I should send people to. Mm -hmm. um, and so anybody, any veterinarian can do it. Uh, and also non-veterinarians sometimes, I get a little bit upset when I see people going to shelters and they're adopting super old animals and they're like, I'm doing pet hospice. I'm like, no, you're just adopting all that, <laughs> <laughs> which I appreciate. Um. Okay, Sonia just told me we still have four more questions. You All right, I'm okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mary. Thanks everyone else for hanging out. That's all I'm doing for the rest of the day. It was <laughs> BJ Miller, like that was it the whole day. <laughs> All right, this next person said, um, what happens when senior people have a senior dog with special needs of care? What do you recommend if a pet ends up alone due to the death of their people and she can't be rehomed without trauma? Mm. Oh gosh, okay, so. <clears throat> By the way, everyone, not just old, should have uh, like a will or, or directives of what you want to do with your pets because an accident can happen at any time to anybody and we want to make sure our pets are, uh, are safe. So my best friend, Holly, she knows she's in charge of all my animals. I even have a little savings fund. Here you go, Holly. Take mm -hmm. care of them all. So, um, it, but, but of course, with senior people, our, our time is, is, is limited. I think it's really important to prep for that and, and talk to family and friends because it's also difficult to say, assume that your family is going to take on a, a, a geriatric pet. Hmm. Uh, what we've been asked a lot, which, which is, is a tough spot for us to be put in, is I want to have it in my will that if I die, you have to euthanize my pet. Ooh. So we say no to that, but what we do suggest is to say, when you die, you give your veterinarian or us or your veterinarian the, the right to make the best suggestion, because it may be that euthanasia is the best option for that pet. It may be adoption out. Do not be, do not underestimate those of us who like a jalopy, right? Mm -hmm. I love an old dog. Like I will not ever adopt a puppy or a kitten again. Like it is six or up at least, double digits is better. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of us that like that. There's a lot of us that have a certain disease that we, I don't want to say like, but, but we're familiar with and we're okay managing. There's a lot of dogs with Cushing's and so a person's going to adopt another Cushing's dog. So they know there's breed specific rescues out there, like out the wazoo, there's pit bull rescues, do doodle rescues, all of that, right? Um, so I just think preparing for that so that way you're also comfortable with at peace to know if something happens to you that you've got somebody to care for, for your pets and what the options are. Because 
I know that a lot of people say it's very traumatizing for pets to be rehomed. And sometimes it is. I, I, I do have an animal, a dog that's got separation anxiety mm. and it's hard, but my girl, Sam, that is an angel now, like she does, she's, she's all out of anything to care. She would just gone anywhere. Like, okay. <laughs> it's us that think that, you know, I'm the best thing ever for Sam. So, <laughs> uh, so death is not always the best option for them. And sometimes it is appropriate. It's mm. all case by case. Well, I love your point. That's great. I mean, I, and the, one of the huge takeaways there from, from where I sit is, is this, you know, advanced directives that for those of us, you know, all humans, 18 and up, should have an advanced directive, if you ask me, and it, this is a perfect thing to include. Um, 100%. So, yeah, that, my, I, my sister who, who passed this summer, she had three dogs, and one was 16 or something like that, and, and she did not have any advanced directive, like, at all. So guess who the family looks to? Me, right? Yeah. And they're like, oh, Mary, you like old dogs? <laughs> I'm like, I do mm. So uh, I wish she had something and we're, you know, we're taking care of them as a family, but it would have been good if, if we knew that she has a friend somewhere that she prefer, whatever it may be. So yeah. advanced directives, hundred yeah. percent. Right on. Okay. Sounds. On that topic, this is more just about word use. Why is the expression put down still so widely used, even when people thoughtfully make choices for their pets? <laughs> Euthanasia is much more accurate and sympathetic in my opinion. I know. I, I don't know. There's also put, yeah, put dog down. There's um, put to sleep. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that scares kids because then they're like, I don't want to go to sleep tonight, mm -hmm. right? Because that could happen. Euthanasia. Some people don't even know the word euthanasia. Some people it's youth in Asia, like young people in the continent of Asia, right? They don't understand what that is. Mm -hmm. So it is, you know, I wonder what would be the better, a better word. I don't like, I don't say put but I don't say it, but that's because I'm in this business. And, but did I 20 years ago? I probably did. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, um, and it's interesting because Google searches, I know what people are searching for and put dog down is like the highest search for right. it. So it is still just the way that we say stuff or put to sleep. I think put to sleep is the, is the more common uh, way to say it uh, than, than euthanasia. But yeah. I mean, I don't even remember the first time I ever heard the word euthanasia. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sitting here thinking, and it's the same problem of youth, euphemism. Some people just don't know what the heck you're talking about. I and mean, your point about going to sleep, that can really freak kids out. So anyway, I don't know. I don't, it doesn't sound like there really is a good answer. I don't have a good per answer. Per se. So you kind of work within the vernacular of the person. Yeah. That's the closest you got. Um, okay. So all right. We got two more here. This one, um, Mary is actually from someone who works at Laugh Love. I'm just not sure which one. And they asked, are there special donors that assist family with non-insurance covered illnesses rather than having to euthanize or surrender their baby? Are there donors? So I wonder if, if Sheila's, or I don't know if Sheila, sorry. So there are, there are, there is one and I'm, I'm like, drawing a blank on it that can it's tough guys there there's not a lot of help out there there's a few things right but there's not a lot of help so that's where i that's why i like insurance or budgeting or something like that for this there's like i love the gray muzzle organization but they they do grants to shelters for senior pets that are in a shelter not necessarily in a home so uh if that person works we can put it in the chat so we can share it because i think she's trying to lead me somewhere that I'm drawing a blank on. Um, and by the way, hi, Sheila. Hi, Danny, if you guys are on there. Um, Stephanie's on there, I'm sure. Oh, oh Steph. Hi, Steph. Oh, my Lord. A question's um, from Cheryl Stewart. I don't know if that that's someone you know. Oh, Cheryl. T t Cheryl, put something in the chat. Or the <laughs> I think she's trying to lead me. I'm going blank. <laughs> Um, and then this last one, you know, we could, this is kind of the, the whole theme of the talk. Um, how do you cope with the loss of a pet? I am overwhelmed with sadness. Oh, it's the same way in humans, right? How do you, how do you cope? It's one inch at a time, you know, you just be overwhelmed, be whatever the hell you are, um, is one start. And it's to start by being emotionally honest, make space around you, know that you're going to be altered for a while. So not a great time for impulsive decisions. 
a good time to surround yourself with things that bring you peace, people who are comforting, you know, remembering the things that cause that, br that bring you joy, even if they don't bring you joy now. So you don't forget what it feels like. Mm. Um, but not convincing yourself that you're supposed to feel something different is a big thing that just takes the shame out. I don't think there's any, there is no shortcut, but again, sadness is not your enemy. There's something very sweet about you're sad because you love that's the connection. Yeah. That, that's what I always say it. You're I think Winnie the Pooh's got like the best quotes, like, you know, don't forget what it is. I can't think of it off the top of my head, but just gotta go look at a Winnie the Pooh quote. I'm like that guy, that guy was smart. <laughs> we have at Lapa Love a, a six week curriculum actually of pet loss that go, that helps with tools to help families that are needing a little bit more. And that's very helpful. And, and I do think sometimes with the ceremonies and rituals, you know, that's a part of the morning. Sometimes the, we're the concentrating on the grief, but mourning is the, the external ways that we can, you know, remember them is, is helpful. But let me tell you, I've sat for weeks sniffing my dog's collar. Like there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And I missed it. Right. So it is, it's one inch at a time. Yeah. It really, it really is. And sometimes just talking about it and I'm not a group person. Like I don't like cut loss groups myself. People want them. And, uh, but it can be helpful for, for many others or, or, um, but it's hard. Sometimes I can't look at pictures right away. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I want to make a scrapbook. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I got no more wisdom than that. It's, <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's part of the deal. Just remember, again, remember, this is part of the deal. This is, this is, it's related to love. This is not some aberrancy. There's nothing wrong with you. Um, and most one way or another, I don't know the grief ends per se, but these things do shift. The way you feel now is not the way you're going to feel in six months or a year from now. It's most, mm -hmm. I can probably guarantee that. Um, anyway, okay, Sones, more? Well, just one final comment, since we were talking about other programs, um, one of the participants wrote in and said the Red Rover Relief Urgent Care Grant Program provides financial assistance, resources, and emotional support for pet guardians struggling with economic hardship when pets are in life-threatening situations. So I will add that um, to our list of resources perfect. as well. Yeah, Sheila yeah. just texted me that. So. <laughs> oh, perfect. <laughs> That's why the smart, I, I surround myself with people smarter than me. <laughs> <laughs> And make sure I got a cell phone near me so I can. <laughs> That's why you're so smart. Thank you so much for going, for A, being here, Mary, and then going over to answer everyone's questions. I'm we sorry, really but yeah, it. we went over, but no, it's <laughs> good. helpful. It's so good. And the, these, it's so helpful. And the longer answers are really, this stuff's complicated. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. It's such a pleasure you're being right. with you, period. So uh, thank I love, you. love people. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Thanks Bye, for being yeah. here, everyone. Happy weekend to everybody. Bye. Yes. Bye.